really wanted to spend some time talking about diagnosis. Because in some ways, meds are easy. The challenging thing, especially in autism, I always tell my fellows and students, treating autism is a little bit like doing AP psychiatry. Because you're dealing with the patient that sometimes can't talk. Even if they can talk, part of the social impairment is that they have a hard time recognizing emotions and expressing them. So this is the most challenging part of our jobs when working with people with autism is figuring out what's going on. So um, Chris McDougall and I uh, from the Lurie Center, we took some time to really think this through and create a clinically relevant algorithm for breaking down repetitive thoughts. We've already talked about preoccupations. The key distinct feature there is that the thoughts do not cause the person any distress whatsoever. Um, however, people with autism are not immune from experiencing other types of repetitive thoughts related to OCD, anxiety, mood disorders, even psychosis. So the trick is, what we would recommend is rather than going straight for diagnosis, is try and categorize the type of repetitive thought and that will really help you narrow your differential diagnosis. So first you say, is it distressing? No, preoccupation, okay, don't worry about it. Is it, if it is distressing, we wanna think about how much insight does the person have? And of course this is a continuum, right? It's not a light switch. Um, people with more insight, that tends to be more of a rumination, oh, sorry, an obsession. Ruminations are more in the middle. Um, and then overvalued ideas and delusions are really on the, the opposite end where people are really starting to lose insight. And once you can say, okay, this repetitive thought is rumination, then that narrows your differential, so you're thinking, okay, mood or anxiety disorder. Same thing for repetitive behaviors. Um, there are a number of repetitive behaviors that we see in our patients. We've already talked about stereotypies, but patients with autism are at elevated risk for a wide variety of repetitive movements. And I would actually say probably more often than not when I see a kid in my clinic, they're not only flapping and stimming, but they're also doing maybe two or three other types of repetitive movements. So you have an algorithm here um, to help clinicians figure out what's going on, because once you know what's going on, the treatment's really not that difficult. So first you say, has this person been exposed to a dopamine antagonist, like an antipsychotic? If yes, you have to pause and really assess for extrapyramidal symptoms. Then you say, do they have altered level of consciousness? If yes, you gotta really think about seizures because people with autism are at very uh, increased risk of seizures. The next differentiating point is, are the movements goal directed? Because that will help you differentiate compulsions where there's a clear goal related to relieving anxiety related to the obsession um, versus stereotypies and tics, which aren't clearly goal directed. We know what stereotypies are now, how tics can be differentiated from stereotypies. And this is really important, remember, because I said, well, we don't really treat stereotypies. They're not causing anyone any harm and it may actually be um, giving the patient some relief. Well, there are a few differences. First, stereotypies are rhythmic, whereas tics are jerky. Second, um, tics usually have a premonitory urge associated with them. It's kind of like how you feel before you need to sneeze. Some little, little kids won't be able to identify that, but most adolescents can. And third, tics are momentarily suppressible. 